Hi, I'm Amy Baudet from the Alt Store. Thank you for watching our video series. This video is called Solar Electric Components Part 2. We've broken it down into multiple parts to keep it manageable. If you missed our earlier videos, I recommend you go back and watch the earlier ones in the series to get a good foundation, including Part 1 covering solar panels and batteries. We're going to go over a couple more of the main components in a solar electric system the charge controller, and the inverter. Keep in mind that technology is moving forward at an incredible rate, so I'm going to be making some generalities that are true today, but there are likely to be exceptions, as with most rules. Let's start with the solar charge controllers. A charge controller is an important component in a battery-based system. Many charge controllers manage charging the batteries by sending different voltages and currents to the battery bank based on how full the battery is. Much like pouring a glass of water, when the glass is fairly empty, you can have the faucet on full blast, but when it starts to get full, you want to turn down the faucet to prevent overflowing. Likewise, a charge controller sends a lot of power to the battery when it is low, but as it approaches full, it slows it down. Once it is full, it will send a smaller amount of power, a trickle charge, to keep it topped off. With bulk charging, when the battery is low, it will accept all the current provided by the solar system and send it to the battery. At absorption, the battery has reached the regulation voltage, so the controller begins to hold the voltage constant. This is to avoid overheating and overgassing the battery. The current will taper down to safe levels as the battery becomes more fully charged. Equalization is done only with flooded batteries, not with sealed batteries. Many batteries benefit from a periodic high voltage boost charge to stir the electrolyte, level the cell vo voltages, and complete the chemical reactions. Your battery specs will tell you how often it and at what rates it wants to be equalized. Float charge is when the battery is fully recharged the charging voltage is reduced to prevent further heating or gassing of the battery. There are three main types of solar charge controllers. Shunt batteries that just turn the flow to the batteries on or off, they're really used anymore, so we won't go into them. The two main types you'll find these days are pulse width modulation, or PWM, and maximum power point tracking, or MPPT. Let's discuss them in greater detail. PWM are the less expensive option. A PWM charge controller pulses the power sent to the battery bank, allowing it to do the different charging stages we discussed. When using a PWM charge controller, the voltage of the solar panel must be the same nominal voltage as the battery bank. So if you're using a 12 volt battery, you must use a 12 volt solar panel. If you have a 48 volt battery bank, you must wire four 12 volt panels or two 24 volt panels in series to make 48 volts. Make sure the charge controller you select is designed for that battery bank voltage. Some can support multiple voltage ranges, others are designed for only one voltage. Note if a PWM charge controller says it can support 12 or 24 volt, both the panel and battery bank must be one or the other. It's not saying it can take a 24 volt panel to charge a 12 volt battery. It is saying it can work in either a 12 volt or a 24 volt system. A maximum power point tracking or MPPT charge controller is the more sophisticated and more expensive type of solar charge controller. It tracks the output of the solar array and adjusts itself so the output is always maximized. In doing so, it can increase the production of the array by up to 30%. Another great advantage is that most MPPT charge controllers can take a higher voltage array, for instance a 60 volt array, to charge a lower voltage battery bank like a 48 volt. This is required if you have a 60 cell, 20 volt grid tied solar panel, those are the common types, and therefore they're less expensive, and then want to use it to charge a 12 volt battery. It's also very useful if you have to go a distance from your array to your battery bank. The higher the voltage of the solar array, the lower the current going across the wire. Therefore, you can use smaller gauge wire, which will cost less, and have a, a lower voltage drop, which gets more of your power to the batteries. 
There are also a few MPPT charge controllers that can take a lower voltage panel and charge a higher voltage battery bank. These are great to use a 12 volt panel to charge your 36 or 48 volt golf cart. But most MPPTs require either a higher or equal to voltage panel. Be sure to read the specs carefully. There's a wide range of features that are optional on some, but not all, charge controllers. In most cases, a display does not automatically come with a controller, but can be added separately for a remote display. A few even have Ethernet connections, allowing you to monitor your system across the web. Temperature compensation will improve the battery bank charging by adjusting its output based on the temperature. Low voltage disconnect is a great feature that allows you to connect your DC load straight to the charge controller. If the battery voltage gets low, it will turn off the load, preventing the batteries from becoming too low and getting damaged. Some controllers can be used as a diversion or dump load controller, turning power on to a heater to burn off excess power. There are others that have light control functions, turning lights on and off automatically. Solar charge controllers are rated by both voltage and amps. As we said, PWM charge controllers support the same voltage in as out. Check the specs to make sure what voltage that controller supports. MPPT specs will list the maximum VOC voltage it can support, which is higher than the nominal voltage. A typical 150 volt charge controller can support up to three 20 volt panels in series. We must remember that cold weather increases the voltage output of a solar panel. If we say the VOC of a panel is 38 volts, 3 in series equals 114 volts. But if we also figure in the cold temperature in the winter, we increase the voltage. So you can see why, at least in cold climates, 3 20 volt nominal panels would max out the 150 volt charge controller. There are now higher voltage charge controllers available, with some accepting as much as 600 volts in. This is very useful as if the array is a long distance away from the battery bank. Charge controllers are also rated by the current range they are able to support. PWM charge controllers just pass the power through from the panels to the battery bank, so there is no adjustment. Current in equals current out. You would select the charge controller based on the ISC, or short circuit current, of the solar array. MPPT charge controllers are rated by their current output, not their input. If you are inputting 60 volts and outputting 24 volts, the voltage is going to drop because power, or watts, equals volts times amps. To keep power constant, anything I do to the volts, I have to do the opposite to the amps. So when the volts drop on the output of the charge controllers, the amps will increase. To figure out what the output will be from the charge controller, take the total watts of the solar array and divide it by the voltage of the battery bank. For instance, 1000 watts into a charge controller that is connected to a 24 volt battery bank will output 41 amps. So I need to find a charge controller that can output at least 41 amps, like the TriStar MPPT45. Next up is inverters. The primary job of an inverter is to convert the DC, or direct current, power from the battery bank as seen in the red line, to AC, or alternating current power, needed for most appliances. To do that, it must take the constant DC voltage and change it to a sine wave curve that goes above and below zero volts. When inverters first came out, the most common way to do this was to make the voltage go straight up and down, creating a blocky signal. This is called a modified sine wave. More advanced modified sine waves make multiple steps, trying to get as close as possible to a pure sine wave. You can see the output of a modified sine wave on an oscilloscope to the bottom left. It is an approximation of a pure sine wave shown on the right. So other than how the signal looks, what's the difference between the two outputs? A modified sine wave inverter can be used for simple systems that don't have any delicate electronics or audio equipment that may pick up choppy wave and produce a hum, Tube TVs and, and motors with brushers are usually fine with modified sine wave. But your digital clock will likely act funky, and battery rechargers quite often just plain old won't work. Some equipment m may seem to be working fine, 
but it may run hotter than with a pure sine wave and reduce the life of it. It's very difficult to say exactly what will and won't work with modified sine wave inverters. Pure sine wave is always needed for grid tied system. It is generally needed for the newer LED TVs, uh, CFL and LED light bulbs, and inductive loads like brushless motors. Generally, modified sine wave inverters are less expensive than a pure sine wave inverter, so they are still commonly used in simple systems. But as technology advances, the cost of pure sine wave inverters is coming down, making them much more affordable and really the favorite option these days. Inverters are used in three different types of solar systems, grid-tied, off-grid, or grid-tied with battery backup. We'll go through all three options one at a time. A grid-tied inverter only connects the solar panel directly to the electric company's grid through fuses and breakers. Through net metering, if you make more power than you use, your electric meter spins backwards. More often than not, it will just spin slower as your house uses all the power you make and needs to buy less power from the grid. At night or during cloudy days, you just buy all of your power from the grid, same as usual. If the grid goes out, so will your house power, even if the sun is shining. The only noticeable difference is that your electric bill will be lower than before you got solar. When selecting a grid-tied inverter, it's based on the size of your solar array. A 5 kilowatt array will use about a 5 kilowatt inverter. You need to match the electrical service you get from the grid. If you have three phase, 480 volts, 60 hertz, for instance, on a commercial site, you need to specify a three phase, 480 volt, 60 hertz inverter. Most residential inverters in the North America will be single phase, 240 volt, 60 hertz. Micro inverters have become very popular for grid tied systems. Instead of one or two large string inverters, micro inverters install in the back of the solar panels, generally one per panel. They convert the DC power to AC at the panel. The advantage of this is that if you have partial shading on some of the panels, it doesn't affect the output of the whole string of panels like it would with a string inverter. You can also have a deeper view into the system, monitoring down to the panel level instead of the, just on the whole inverter. Microinverters are very helpful if you have future expansion in mind. You just add more panels and more inverters as needed. You don't even need to match the panels as you would with a string inverter. However, the inverters are outside, albeit shaded by the solar panel, so it is more exposed to the weather than a string inverter that's installed inside that building. Microinverter systems can also be a little bit more expensive than a, a string size system. With an off-grid inverter, these are used for standalone systems where the grid is not available. Once the charge controllers charge up your battery bank, the off-grid inverter converts the 12, 24, or 48 volt battery bank to AC voltage. The AC output depends on your requirements. In North America, you can use 120 volt single phase, 240 volt split phase, 208 or 480 volt three phase, etc. Depending on how you wire the output of the inverter and which inverter you get, you could have both 120 and 240 volts as the output. You need to determine what your loads require and select and configure the inverter accordingly. An off-grid inverter cannot sell extra power back to the grid. However, an inverter charger can connect to the grid, if available, to act as a battery charger. For instance, if you have a boat or an RV with an inverter charger, when you connect to shore power, you can use the grid to charge your battery bank when the solar doesn't provide enough power. But that AC connection is, is one directional. It will only take power from the grid, not send it back. Likewise, you can often connect a generator to the AC input of an inverter charger to top off the batteries when needed. This is a common configuration for off-grid homes that need more power in the winter than the sun can provide. When selecting an inverter, you must determine what your maximum wattage draw will be if all your appliances that may be on at the same time are on. If you have an 800 watt well pump, a 100 watt fridge, five 10 watt lights, and a 50 watt laptop, 
you'll need to add the wattages together to get at least a 1000 watt inverter. You also have to make sure the inverter is able to handle the surge as motors turn on. For example, if your fridge and well pump both turned on at once, the surge could be three times the rated wattage. You must make sure the inverter can handle that. Inverters are rated in both the continuous wattage and the surge capability. Additionally, you need to select the battery bank size and buy the inverter to match. Inverter voltage is not field selectable. They are either 12 volt, 24 volt, or 48 volt. They cannot do all of them, just one. A grid tied battery backup inverter is the best of both worlds. Under normal circumstances, it converts the power from the DC battery bank and provides AC power to the house, selling any extra back to the grid. At night, your house just gets its power from the grid, same as usual. But when the grid goes out, that's when these shine, so to speak. When installing a grid tied battery backup system, you select which appliances in your house you want to back up with battery power and take these off your main breaker panel and connect them instead to a critical loads panel. When the grid is out, only the items wired to the critical loads panel get powered. So you can have your well pump, fridge, freezer, and some lights remain on while the rest of your house is off. This allows you to have a smaller battery bank and PV array than if you were to have an off-grid system because you're only powering a small subset of your house when the grid is out. You reduce your electric bill, but you can also keep important things running when the grid is out without having to run a generator. When selecting grid tied battery backup inverter, you need to base it both on the battery bank voltage as well as the size of your array. You also have to base it on the wattage of your critical loads, including the surge. So as you can see, there's a bit of planning when selecting the right inverter. Battery based inverters have a lot of options to choose from. Not all of the inverters have all of the same features, so you need to decide which features are required and select the inverter based on which has them. Some of the features are the ability to charge a battery bank from an AC source like the grid or a generator, even automatically starting the generator when the batteries are low and turning it off when they are charged. Some can automatically use the generator to assist with high loads. Since the inverter is often installed in an out of the way location near the batteries, a remote control or display in the living area is useful to keep an eye on the system. Some inverters even have the ability to monitor the system remotely via the web. This is very useful for part-time locations that you're not always there to keep an eye on it. Many inverters can be stacked to increase either the voltage or the current, or both. This allows you to use multiple inverters in a master-slave configuration, automatically turning on only the inverters as needed, conserving battery power. Check out our website for a great selection of solar charge controllers and inverters available. Also watch more of our video series on our website, including part one where we covered solar panels and batteries. We've got a team of highly trained technical sales reps available to help you plan your system. Give us a call. And don't forget to check out the rest of our site at altestore.com where we are making renewable doable.